Okay, so we were talking about mutations and how mutations can happen. When I talked about those things called proto-oncogens and tumor suppressor cells earlier, those are two of the primary places that you have changes or mutations. So when you think of the main types of mutated genes, you want to think of the accelerators. What would that be? Would that be the oncogen or the tumor suppressor? The oncogen, right, because the tumor suppressor is telling you it's suppressing or breaking. So the accelerator is one way you can have it. When you look, and this is a picture from your text, you've got, there's the cell membrane. Here you have little receptors on the surface. You have all of these enzymes that are on the inside that are causing some kind of chain reaction and then finally turning on some kind of a gene. So an accelerator, what could happen is that this receptor could get clogged. If the receptor gets clogged, it's like putting your foot on the accelerator, letting off of it, and it stays to the ground. Everything inside keeps working faster, faster, faster because this receptor got jammed. So one of the things could be a, that could change acceleration is that you can have overactivation of receptors. Autocrine means that this cell is actually stimulating itself with hormone-like chemicals. It releases a growth factor that comes back and tells itself to grow. It's like positive self-talk. But autocrine, what happens is it releases something, it comes back and sticks that receptor on. It's like jamming the accelerator to the floor. Next thing, you could, could, uh, next thing that could happen is it could be a growth factor receptor. So overactivity of growth. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Another thing that could happen are these enzymes could be stuck in the on position. So one of these enzymes in this chain reaction could be stuck over and over and over and over again. Does it matter if the accelerator is on the floor? Nope. You don't even have to have this accelerator here. If any part of the machinery going down to the genes is stuck on, it keeps causing replication over and over. So some kind of a mutation in any of this pathway can cause a problem. We keep telling the genes, keep making this up, keep making more, keep making more. And the key player on the inside is something called RAS. And I'm using that stickler for understanding names of little tiny enzymes, but this is one of those. When you look at cancers and they talk about the RAS gene, it's an accelerator. So if you have an overly active RAS, what's it telling you? If the RAS is an accelerator and you have an overly active RAS, it means it's reproducing extremely rapidly. So that's one of the things that could happen. The accelerator gets stuck to the floor and you can't stop. Oops. Uh, how did I stick over that? Oh, sorry, I forgot to put this slide in. So one of the examples of a stuck accelerator is pancreatic cancers. So one of the most dangerous pancreatic cancers is they have a mutation in this thing called the KRAS, the specific kind of RAS. And about 95% of pancreatic cancers are because of this. You have one cell that gets stuck and then it replicates, made two cells. They still have the same stuck or broken RAS. They replicate and they replicate. Before you know it, you've got some huge mass that's growing inside the pancreas. Walking up blood vessels, walking up endocrine and exocrine functions. So you may have digestive issues, you may have hormone issues. What hormone automatically pops in your mind when you think of the pancreas? Mm -hmm. Insulin. So you may have problems with regulating blood sugar, the things the brain trying to get good sugar, the heart trying to get good sugar. Nothing's going to be working right. That's why pancreatic cancer is so dangerous because it affects everything endocrine and exocrine function. Right? So basically now these things are called cancer stem cells. They're rapidly replicating. Do they look like pancreas cells anymore? Mm -hmm. Nope. They're anaplastic. They have no shape, no distinguished shape. And they've lost differentiation. And this is so dangerous, you can see the one year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is 25%. That means that in one year, 25% of the people that get cancer are still alive. The five year rate, 6%. That's the average. Then you always hear the exception of the rule. Um, who's the Apple guy? Steve Jobs. I don't remember how long he lived. It was longer than five years. But he was the exception of the rule, and it still ended up fading in life. Okay. And then the average for pancreatic cancer is about six to ten months. Okay, here we go. And then the second thing that can break is the brakes. Breaking the brakes. So sometimes you'll have a gene that actually suppresses this reproduction. This pathway may get turned on, but it's a good thing you have good brakes because then you just slam on the brakes. If you slam on the brakes, then you're just spinning the wheels, but it's not replicating. 
Right? One of the most important, there are a couple of them, but one of the most important is the RB in the suppressor. It's a gene. It's called the retinoblastoma gene. We'll talk about it in just a few slides again. But the RB gene is a tumor suppressor. As long as you have a good copy of this gene, you can stop cells from reproducing. Another one's the P53. So the P53 gene, this is actually a repair and a break gene. This is an interesting gene because if you remember the cell cycle, as you're going through that whole cycle, you have checkpoints all the way along the way. As you get to a checkpoint, then you go through and you say, did everything replicate properly? Are we in track? Is anything mutated in a bad way that's going to cause problems? And if any of those things are flawed, the P53 gene comes out and stops everything. The checkpoint says there's a flaw, P53 is released, and P53 hits the brace. It says don't replicate. If we can't fix this, then we're going to commit apoptosis. So people that are missing this break, they get the checkpoints, and even if it's flawed, there's no break, so they just go to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, they replicate this flawed cell. The next cell is just as flawed with no P53. It replicates, same thing. So they constantly keep replicating over and over and over again. And the other one is the BRCA. And what's that associated with? Breast cancer. Yeah, ovarian cancer too, but we automatically just pop into our head breast cancer. So 60% of the tumors are actually related to P53 breakdown. 50% of the tumors. 60, sorry, 60%. What did I say? Sorry, 60% of tumors, P53. Okay, and then here are the keys to the, like I said, this is an important one. Here are the keys to it. The first thing is that the P53 activates DNA repair protein. So you hit that checkpoint and there are flaws. P53 comes out, we already said it, hits the brakes, but it also turns on repair mechanisms. It's trying to repair the DNA. So it's basically applying the brakes and then it's over here, it's fumbling with the DNA, trying to fix it or patch it or make things better. Number two is the brakes. It holds the cell cycle. So, I'll just draw a quick cell cycle. You probably remember this in every class. This is science-based class. You've probably seen this. You get this round circle. And you've got this big phase called interphase. And in each part of these, you have G1, S, G2, and then you have five phases. There's a checkpoint right here. If you go through this G1, you hit the checkpoint, and everything's okay, you progress through S. You hit the checkpoint. You progress through here, and there are actually a couple checkpoints in here. But if you're flawed, if you didn't do the job properly here, P53 comes out, and P53 stops everything. It stops progression through the cell cycle. It starts acting like a repair mechanism to fix things. So those are the first two. And the third one, it initiates apoptosis. If it can't fix the cell, what's it tell the cell to do? Die. So we'd rather have you die than become a cancer cell. So it initiates apoptosis. And this last one prevents angiogenesis. Angio refers to vessels. Genesis is the creation of new. So it prevents this cancer from growing new blood vessels. Why would that be significant? Because if the cancer is growing and getting bigger, all those cells that are far away from a blood vessel are going to do what? They're going to die. So what the cancer does is it wants to survive. It starts causing you to grow new blood vessels into this cancerous lump. That's called angiogenesis. So this puts the brakes on angiogenesis. It says no need to grow new blood vessels because this is an abnormal cell. So it repairs, tries to repair the cell, and if it can't do that, it kills it. It puts the brakes on... If it, and while it's putting the brakes on, like I said, repairs it, and then it tries to stop from getting nutrients. So P53. And a lot of these targets, and you don't have to memorize this, but just as an example, you break the DNA, the DNA has flaws, and it's going through replication, and detects their changes. Things like P53 and BRCA will come out to try and stop. Once they come out, then they're going to turn on machinery to try and repair if this thing doesn't get repaired, what should happen to the cell? 
They should die. They should go through apoptosis. What they find is that when there's a flaw in the BRCA gene, when this thing has mutations, the BRCA doesn't make the breaks, so what's going to happen to it? It's going to replicate with flaws. The next cell is going to have these same flaws, and it just keeps replicating, replicating, replicating. And if we're talking about BRCA, what kind of cancer is this usually done? Breast or ovarian breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So some of the therapies, are, can we target that and try and replace the BRCA? And of course, if we do that, then we're going to have to do it in all the cells. But, and so this is just an example. You don't have to memorize that. Okay. So that whole angiogenesis. Remember, if this tumor is growing, it needs blood. What's the name of the process where it grows for any blood cells? Sorry, yeah, blood vessel cells. Angiogenesis. So if it's growing, it'll actually branch off. Well, this is chemical. in the environment. It stimulates the growth of the new blood vessels. So it's growing and growing and growing. And I yeah, already answered that. So angiogenesis is growth of new blood vessels. And then they secrete this stuff called VEGF. It's called vascular endothelial growth factor. I have to memorize this name. But this VEGF, it's an enzyme. It's released by the tumors. It goes out here to the blood vessels and says, hey, start growing this way. And it starts growing, leading the pathway up here so the tumor can get bigger and bigger and bigger. And why this is significant is because you'll actually find that a lot of chemotherapeutic agents have an anti-VEGF in them. So this avastin binds to the VEGF and prevents it from allowing the blood vessels to grow. The good thing is it's going to stop, the, it's going to slow or stop the tumor growth. The bad thing is that if there are other parts of the body that need to heal and to repair blood vessels, what do you know is going to happen? I'm not going to be able to do it. So, do people heal really well when they're on chemotherapy? No. Okay, and then cell immortality. And we talked about these before. The telomeres are little caps at the end of the chromosome. It's one race keeps the cats really healthy. But when you're a small child, you stop making tremorants. And then every time the cell replicates, it's shorter and shorter and shorter. It's like a candle, and the fuse is burning shorter and shorter. Until the cells replicate roughly 50 times, and then it commits apoptosis. So what happens in the cancer cells, normally, telomerase is shut off, but the cancer cell has found a way to turn it back on. So it can replicate how many times? Indefinitely, yeah. It's a normal. It turns on that gene or that chromosome that holds the gene for telomerase. And it just keeps causing replication over and over. So you can replicate a numeral times time, and then it's still just as good as a baby cell. So our bodies have that death gene, they say, that after about 50 replications, they stop replicating. So. Here's kind of a summary of the different things. When you're looking at the hallmarks of cancer, you get the cancers that are self-sufficient. They're autonomous. I don't know what it was. But they're autonomous. I hate my hands. It's faster than I think. So it's autonomous. It just keeps doing what it wants to do. There's nothing regulating. It's insensitive to anti-growth signals. Again, autonomy. It evades apoptosis. So it doesn't want to be shut off. It tries to avoid being killed. And then it's immortal. It can replicate indefinitely. Cancer cells, what's it mean to have sustained angiogenesis? There it is. Yep, it keeps making new blood vessels. Which, if it's making new blood vessels and rerouting the blood somewhere else, what's going to happen to all those other cells downstream of the cancer? They start getting, yeah, they start going through what were they shrink? They'll atrophy until they can die off. Right? And then the big one with cancer is the tissue invasion. So if it's tissue invasion, is it benign or malignant? It's malignant. And then if you look back through the slides, you can see how each of these are actually in. So we talked about evading apoptosis by shutting off T53. We talked about the growth, the rapid growth, RAS, the accelerator being stuck on. And since the growth factors, we haven't talked about RB yet, but just a little bit. There's a tumor suppressor. And then uh, inactivating the e adherence. This is when it doesn't care where it grows. It just keeps overwhelming the other cells. And then the angiogenesis, it makes that VEGF stuff. So here are each of the key things <coughs> that the cancer cell does. Okay, so how cells mutate. 
They can mutate through point mutations and chromosome mutations, which we already talked about. So point mutations, remember, the base pair are a few base pairs that change. With chromosomes, the whole chromosome break. And in this situation, remember how we broke a piece off and actually put it on two different chromosomes? Translocation. Maybe a whole section. Okay, there are two main areas, and I'll talk about each of them. Okay, so the first one, instability. Amplification is really tricky. So if you have a gene like this, so here I have a piece of chromosome. I'll just put the leg like that. And I break off this tip. And this floats over and binds to another chromosome, which is a little bit shorter. And it sticks or gets glued on here. If this area of this chromosome was there to make red blood cells, this area was only in times when you were sick. It turned on. Now that they fuse together, every time you make a red blood cell, what am I going to make with it? A piece of this. How often do you make red blood cells? Often. Yeah, 5 million a second. So you're making, cranking out red blood cells constantly. Sometimes you get a location like this, where something that, uh, we'll say that this is a, an enzyme for the world. Now every time I make a red blood cell, I'm also turning on this enzyme, like a growth factor, over and over and over again. Instead of having this only in times when I'm sick and I need to repair something, now I've amplified its effects. I'm constantly making it. It's like dumping fertilizer all over a wheat garden. If you start making tons and tons of this enzyme, it just amplifies its effects. And in this situation, this is, this is actually a neuron, and you have a growth factor that's inside of it. And then what happens when you switch translocate, once I turn on one little bit, it actually starts making tons and tons of this stuff. So you have an overactive expression of whatever that chemical is. And if that chemical is a growth factor, I said it's like miracle grow on a weed garden. So it's over and over and over and over again. So it's bad news. Okay. Here's an example of that. Neuroblastoma. So when you look at a neuron that's actually replicating, 50% of the tumors that are because of a neuron are extremely aggressive. I always think of it as, man, these neurons, they don't replicate anymore. So if they get a chance to replicate, they just go nuts. So neuroblastoma is when you look at the number, 50% of all of these happen under the age of two. Anybody know why? Why would you guess? Most these happen to small children. Your brain is actually still growing by the age of two. So when you're first born, you're still growing your neurons. They haven't shut off their application. By the time you're two, you have more neurons in your brain than you have now. So, because what happened is you made all these neurons before two, and then suddenly you start trimming them back and you want to keep the good ones. So, under the age of two, you still have chemical factors that allow neurons to replicate. And that's why you see so many under the age of two. When you look at the statistics, it's most common extra cranial cancer in childhood. So, you'll see it in places like in between the skull and the brain or down the vertebra. And here you can see the little pieces of it going around the orbits. And you see little pieces in the meninges. And then I already said this common in infancy or under the age of two. And then what happens is that they're over-amplified. Those little genes for growth factors are turned on. So if those growth factors start traveling through the body, anywhere that there's a malformed structure, it starts growing. Growing the pancreas, growing the eyes, growing anyway. No blastoma. Okay, next type of chromosomal instability. So one's called loss of heterozygosity. What's heterozygous mean? Two different, what? What's the A word? Alleles. Yep, so when you have two copies of this gene, you have two different alleles. If you lose heterozygosity, it means that you can actually become homozygous, and if you're homozygous for the bad one, is that a good or bad thing? That sucks. The other thing that can happen is that what if you had one good one and one bad one? And then that good one got knocked out. A mutation happened to it. Then what happens? You have one good gene and one bad gene. A mutation affected the good gene. What's your default? Bad gene. Yep, the same thing. 
So we'll also consider Vygotsky. Normally you have good copies on both genes, or at least one good copy, one bad copy. And the Coleman case. So let's say that you have two normal genes. You're a nice, healthy person. You get a mutation, you have the first case. Are you okay? Yep, you still have a good copy over on this yellow chromosome. And then the second hit, you lost the second one. Unfortunately, some people were born in the first hit. Something happened in utero, or his dad or mom gave them a defective gene in the first place, and we had one give them all cases a little bit of a change or mutation, and then it lost it. It's called Ralph Wasser Federal Pygosity. And that's also what we call the two hit hypothesis. You've got two genes and two alleles, it takes two flaws before you actually get this mutation. So the first is typically in the germline, the stem cells, and the second one is some kind of mutation. L O H, otherwise known as S O L. That's sure out of luck. I don't know what you're thinking. But. Okay. And then retinoblastoma is a good example of this. And retinoblastoma, you could guess it the word they named it for. The retina, right? So a lot of times what happens is with retinoblastoma, they get a tumor in the retinal tissue. And the tumor merges, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you remember your layers, the inner layer is retina, the next layer is the forward layer with the blood vessels. So if they get this large tumor structure drawn here, do they get red eye in their eye? Nope. They actually get this weird shiny flashback, and sometimes what you're seeing is actually bounce off of the retina layer. Because red eye is like bouncing off the blood vessel. And here you can see an extreme situation where the tumor just kept growing and growing and growing. You can see the retina layer will work in the way up here. It's like a flat. What is that? It's the wind. Yeah. And it's a huge tumor. And these things can metastasize, and here's something else that metastasize into the spine. Went to the spine and then started growing. Look what it did around the spinal cord. It grew and smashed the spinal cord. So, this is an example of LOH. Some children can be born with it, and they may just have mild symptoms like vision problems, but they get two bad genes, and then a lot of times they get really bad cancers, and they typically start in the eyes and the other parts of the body. This retinoblastoma typically affects kids under 95. Or, and, Affects kids under five, and I started thinking, does anybody remember Jeff Healing? He was a guitar player in the 1980s and 90s. Nobody. Anybody remember the 80s and 90s? No. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, Jeff Healy was a blind guitar player that was born with retinoblastoma. And then eventually it spread to other parts of his body, and that's how he died. Okay, next is gene silencing. So gene silencing is exactly that. It shuts off a gene and completely silences it. So when we're talking about epigenetics before, you may be born with okay genes, but something happens in the environment where it goes and grabs a hold of the and it keeps you from actually using it. So gene silencing is when a part of a gene actually shut off. Typically it's part of a whole chromosome. If you have gene silencing in a place that's typically associated with gene repair, bad news. So if you have gene silencing in somewhere like the BRCA genes, there's no breaks, there's no repair mechanism, and you have a cancer. What would be another example of a break? <coughs> so the letter with two numbers. Mm -hmm. Even would be another good example of a break. So either of those, if you silence those genes, those are for breaks and repair. That means that cell can just keep replicating and replicating. And then the name, special name for these genes is called characteristics. They take care of your genes. If you have a little break or flaw in your chromosomes or your genetics, then they come back and they patch it real quick. They're not always perfect, but they try. If you lose the caretaker genes, then you increase the rate of mutations. Okay. <laughs> Next, gene environment interactions. All right. So how do we know there are gene environment interactions? Well, one example was the situation with breast cancer. Japanese um, Japanese ancestry, Japanese women that are born in Japan have really low rates of breast cancer. You bring them, same family genetics, born in Japan, you bring them over into the United States and you start putting them to our environment, and then their risk of breast cancer goes up higher and higher. So, and here's another example of this colorectal cancer. And you can see Japanese-born males that are brought to the United States 
142 times risk. And then Japanese snails born at 69.3 times risk. Uh, where was the other one? Kerosene. Oh, lab rats. That's another reason we know. We can expose lab rats to cigarette smoke and we watch what happens to their, their cancers. So originally they put the labels on the site that says, if you're a rat, basically. Uh, what was the wording for that? Oh, this product has been known to cause cancer in lab rats in California. You read that passion and think, thank God I'm a rat and I'm not in California, right? <laughs> but with lab rats, we expose them to the carcinogens and we look at what cancers they develop. And we find that it corresponds with the people that are consuming this product or exposed to this product, you see the same kinds of cancers. That's how we know that it raises the risk. So we can look for specific environmental factors. And when I was a kid, my mom always chewed, I think it was Trident or a Carefree gum. It was one of the types of gum, and then I quit chewing it when I actually was old enough to read the label, and it said that this contains whatever chemical it was. I think it was saccharum. And it's been known to cause cancer in lab rats. Thanks, Ma. Um, oh, another fun study. BRCA. BRCA is not a new gene. Its flaws are not new. So this BRC flawed gene has been around for as long as we've been testing in labs, but What's interesting is if you were born, I wrote this down somewhere, if you were born in, before 1940 and you had the BRCA flawed gene, you had a 24% chance of, over the average of having cancer. If you had the exact same mutation, but you were born after 1940, then you have a 67% risk. So, crazy. <laughs> it's the exact same flaw, but just the environment's changed enough. So, genetics and lifestyle. And I thought I had a quote on here that I love. It says that genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. I thought it was on here. Oh, okay. Thanks. But I love that quote. It's a really good quote because it means that if you're born with something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get it. It means you have to be careful with your environment. Right? And then when we look at public policy and how we promote these things, because it seems like there's always a cancer scare about everything. You kind of have to look at a lot of factors. There's a big relationship between time and exposure. Um, even, like, in utero, exposing to certain toxins makes a huge difference. It can expose that kid to you know, certain chemicals and increase his chance of getting cancer down the road. Uh, gender and race have a play in it. Uh, human contamination, so how much you get exposed to. And then when you're looking at the unexplained risk, you have to be careful with what you're looking at for evidence. So don't just freak out every time somebody says cancer. Uh, geez, it's like drinking milk. Oh my gosh, you can't drink milk that whatever, came from a farm where they use antibiotics because it kills your immune system, it destroys you, it causes cancer, blah, 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 makes you wet the pants, whatever. But everybody freaks out about everything. You just have to scrutinize your information a little more carefully. All right, so a link between cancer and pro cancer prone fam families and cures. Then they expose the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. I just thought that was perfect because almost everybody in my family, except my grandmother, ironically, who smoked all of her life, died of cancer. And so it freaks me out. So I'm thinking, I must be prone to cancer. I try and take a little better care of myself. But you just have to look at what your environment is, what your background is. If you are you have a history of breast cancer, there are some things you can do to be cautious. What, they, what do doctors make you start doing earlier and more frequently if you have a history of breast cancer in your family? Yeah, mammograms. You get checked out earlier and you get them more frequently. So there are certain things you can do to try and you know, be cautious. If you have a history of breast, breast cancer, do you want to be a smoker? Yeah. Even if you don't have a history of breast, breast cancer, hopefully you don't. But you're a little bit more careful with what you eat. So being careful with your your environment. And I mentioned this a couple times, somatic versus germline. Somatic is where most of the cancers happen. They happen to you. Germline means it happens to your actual egg or sperm and it's passed on to the next generation. And then we talked a little bit about epigenetics. But. All right, some environmental factors. And big surprise, there's number one up on the top. Tobacco juice is the main, main factor. Your diet has a huge influence. Alcohol, as much as I hate to say that, you know, has an influence too. We know sexual reproductive behavior, HIV, HPV, those can cause cancers. We know HIV, of course, killing you because of your immune system. But HIV has a tendency to raise the risk of cancers too. It brings a lot of other infections with it. Right. There you go. So how does environment interaction cause cancer? Well, there are certain things that are called carcinogens. Carcinogens are cancer generators. <coughs> carcinogens are cancer generators. 
carcinoma or sarcoma or sarco, put in a word in this cancer, malignant version. So things like smoking. When smoking gets in, what it does is they're like, turn 50 roughly chemicals again. I love this. You have those friends that say, well, I only smoke when I drink. You're twice the moron as everybody else, right? So when they only smoke when they drink, what's happening is the smoker breathes in all the stuff and they blow most of it out. Only what touches the mucus is actually what can merge in, and a lot of that's cleared up and they can cough it out or hack it out or maybe pass it down to the GI tract. So for the benefit, if you smoke and you drink at the same time, the alcohol actually makes it more lipid soluble. What gets in your body better? Water soluble or lipid soluble? Whip it. It can cross membranes and go anywhere. It can go all through your muscles, through your bones. So smoking, you have all these carcinogens. When you drink alcohol, it actually introduces them deeper into the tissue. And of course, smoking. Well, thank God I don't drink, right? I don't smoke. Wrong. Because that goes down through your GI tract. Does smoking just cause lung cancer? Nope. Smoking is one of the top causes of GI cancers too. So colorectal cancer, gastrointestinal cancer. So it causes a lot of things. That mucous membrane pushes the carcinogens down through your GI tract and you absorb it in your blood. Um, bone cancers. And we'll talk about those. So smoking. Damaging the DNA sequence, UV radiation coming through, X-ray radiation coming through. I mean, what's the whole purpose of, purpose of melanin, you know? To block UV light, right? So you make the melanin, you block the UV light so it doesn't damage the DNA in the skin. Too much sun exposure, being out in the sun all the time, getting that beautiful tan, what's it actually doing to your DNA in your skin? Causing tiny breaks. If your caretakers can't patch those breaks, then the mutate and it can potentially cause So it damages the DNA sequence. Ionizing radiation like x-rays, they can do it too. And then you can see again the progression. You change one gene, you get a little bit of a change. If you change another gene, you get a little more change. You change another gene, it gets even worse. So when we were talking as a progression before, um, in the GI tract, there were four main genes. You see the same things when you're looking at pancreatic cancer. So normal genes, hyperproliferation, when you start going along. And adenoma, what's being affected there? The gland. Yep, that's the old gland, and then it becomes a cancer and metastasizes the deeper. So it's one step after another of these breaks or these flaws and mutations. And I love the salami being a cause. It's actually nitrates in the salami they think are linking to it. So what does tobacco do? Bad things, lots of bad things. I love it. Tobacco is full of nicotine, which is a toxin to insects and primates. Us monkeys and bugs. Bugs, monkeys, they don't like it. They avoid it as much as possible. What do we do? We roll it and smoke it. Okay, so when you talk about Tobacco, tobacco is multipotent carcinogenic mixture. Multipotent. It's lots of different causes of cancer. You know, like I say, there are 250 different chemicals in the tobacco that are potentially carcinogenic. But it goes in, they cause the flaw in the genes. When the genes make a replication, they're flawed. The worst places that you find cancers in smokers are actually myeloid cancers, which you're talking about inside the bone marrow. So what are you affecting? Inside the bone marrow, what's replicating in there? Red blood cells and white blood cells. Yep. So, so AML, acute myeloid leukemia, is one of the common cancers that you get with smoking. And a lot of people don't go, oh, geez, you know, I get this from, from smoking because it's in their bone. They associate lung cancer with smoking, but what they don't realize is that that chemical got to their blood, went down into their bone, and then caused problems. Cause a DNA sequence change, and now from that point on, it keeps replicating and changing. So AML is one of the common tobacco or nicotine slash tobacco cause cancers. And then why don't all cancer or smokers get lung cancer? One of the theories is that some people just have these happy fairy genes, right? So they have these genes that actually help them detox these carcinogens. Unfortunately, some people don't. It's a crapshoot. Do you have them or you don't you have them? So Maybe you just don't want to smoke, and that'll fix it all. It's the same thing we talked about with alcohol. Some people have better genes than they detoxify alcohol. So if you're missing the good genes, then you're more likely to get the cancers from it. And similar with ep with uh, emphysema too. If you have bad genes, then you may release more genes that break down your alveolar walls and get emphysema faster than the average person in the same situation. Right. This is a fun one. 
So xenobiotics. Xenobiotics are actually, they mean foreign to your body. They're living things, or were at one time living things, that were foreign to your body, exposed to your body, and now they're causing problems. One of the primary places you get xenobiotics is actually from cooking meat on the grill. They've got this, well, number one, it's the gas fumes that go into your meat and cause problems, but you also, when you overchar meats, it changes their structures, and they come these things called xenobiotics. And they become carcinogenic. Carcinogenic. Yeah. They can get in. Um, you don't have to remember the names, it's just the interesting facts. So the next time you're out growing, you can say, food, you say, actually, I want my medium rare, don't char it because I don't want those xenobiotics. So, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, you can keep those to yourself. <laughs> and that's exactly what you say, you know it. But it's the same thing, not everybody gets cancer from this, it's all about what's in your liver and what's in your body to detox it. So there's actually a step-by-step -step process, and I don't know if the pharmacology will go through it, but... Some pharmacology classes make you know it. So step one, the toxin comes in. Step two, you start breaking it down to a, a more comfortable chemical that your body can handle. And then to a simpler, and then finally out of your body. If you're missing any of the genes in that, that pathway, or any genes that make the enzymes for that pathway, then you're screwed. Because you could take in a little bit of chart and suddenly start to become toxic in your body and causing cancer. Same thing with cigarette smoke. And I love the picture with the guy smoking while he's cooking on the grill. It like reminds me of the first first vacation movie when Eddie's grilling and smoking and he's like mixing that Kool-Aid with his hand and everything. I love that. All right, and then alcohol. I hate this question. Can alcohol increase cancer risk? Yes, it can. So, and I already told you one example. What was the big example? Why would it increase cancer risk? Well, liver, it affects your liver too, but it makes everything that wasn't Lipid soluble, lipid soluble. Yeah, whether it's smoking or eating your charred steak with a big glass of beer, it makes all those chemicals more lipid soluble and gets in your body a lot faster. So there's one problem: is it makes other things lipid soluble. You take in toxins, you drink it with a beer or some kind of alcohol, and it makes it in your system faster. Right. And the second one is the same as with anything else. You don't have the proper enzyme. It's a toxin. It's actually a poison. When you bring it into your body, then it can become excessive. It can cause nausea, vomiting, all of those things. It can get into your it's alcohol. It can get into your DNA. It can start shuffling your DNA and loosen up the membranes of cells and cause problems. So it's not it's not just the fact that you're drinking alcohol, but usually it's if you don't have the right genes for the right enzymes to break it down, and if you take it in excessively, or you're taking it in with the wrong chemicals. Those are pretty much the three reasons that it increases the risk of cancer. So, makes everything lipid soluble, including carcinogens, excess, and uh, if you don't have the right enzymes. I was just thinking, is it Reservatrol? Anybody heard of the studies, Reservatrol and wine, that actually reduces the risk of cancers? It's not the alcohol that does it, it's what comes with the alcohol. It's a little, yeah, it's a little chemical in the, the grapes that do it. So if that comes from the grapes, why not just eat the grapes? I'm a total hypocrite right now because I love a glass of wine. All right, next one. So how does sex increase the risk of cancer? We want to think of things like what's the number one thing that we hear about with cancer and sex? HPV, human papilloma virus. And that tells you exactly what it is. Human papilloma. What's it causing? A tumor of the... Epithelium. Remember, papilloma is the sheet-like epithelium. What's the other one? It's the gland-like epithelium. Adenoma. So it's telling you it causes this growth out of the regular epithelial tissue. Not the gland. This is right on the skin. I almost felt, felt awkward touching it. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's funny how your brain does stuff like that. I, I don't have a TV, but I do have a projector on my wall. And it's, if I walk by and I go to lay on the wall, I always feel like I'm a right through the wall. This is strange. But, anyway, and no, I'm not rich. The projector is a cheaper alternative to a flat screen. But anyway, you've got these growths, these abnormal growths going all over the place. They're not glands. They're not secreting things. They're just ugly, hideous growths. Um, and their technical name is condylomata accumulata, which is a fancy tropical sign. Right? What did you get from Tahiti? Tell me what? Oh, yeah, I can't even say it fast and in a funny way. 
but anyway, so HPV, and you know how the process works. HPV gets in, and what's it looking for? What in your cell is it looking for? What structure inside the cell? We'll go with that first. The nucleus, and then it's looking for the DNA inside. So it gets in through this way down into your nucleus and injects in the nucleus. And now anytime that cell replicates, it's going to replicate with this flaw of genetics. The whole purpose of the HPV is to get in there and just replicate itself. But when it gets in, it screws up or disorganizes your own DNA that you start getting this abnormal growth cell that falls into place. There's a lot of activity out of that. And then there are four different HPV viruses. There are over 200 viruses, but there are four that are linked to cancers. And is it just cervical cancer? Can men get HPV cancers? Yeah. When um, Gardasil came out, they just promoted it for women, and it made it seem almost like it's the only affected women, but it actually affects men too. And I think they just released a new version, didn't they, for men, for boys? So, yeah, there are only four of the 200 types of HPV that actually cause cancer. But it can cause cancer in both men and women. So understanding how the virus causes it. The virus goes in and infects the DNA. And that's the base picture. It takes, inserts this gene, and now every time that this cell replicates, it has that flawed DNA. So now suddenly I have all of these flawed cells with that DNA. All it takes is a couple more mutations, and then poof, I got this weird abnormal growth. So it starts mutating. Now I went from metaplastic cells to dysplastic cells. Now they're becoming immortal. They're just growing and growing and growing and growing. So when we talked about the lines of defense, like the first line or first line of prevention, second line of prevention, the first line is, is to do what? Don't get HPV, right? Second line of defense is to monitor to keep track of it. And so with this progression, basically you want to prevent it, and that's why they do so sex and type of programs in schools to try and prevent it. But once it gets in, can you get rid of it? No. Nope. It's there forever. That line from The Hangover, what stays in Vegas, or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Except purpose. That stuff stays forever. I'm paraphrasing if you've seen the movie. But anyway. But that's it. Once you have a virus, it's there. It's permanently there. And with different types of HPV, <coughs> If we swab the desks in here, we'd probably find a dozen different types. So, they're all over the place. Uh, the two... <laughs> what was funny is I used to do tours at DMU, and we had an effective disease lab, and it was always the first lab. And people walk in, they start leaning on the counters and things, and as soon as you told them what the lab was, they're like, off the counters. <laughs> so, infectious disease lab. Yep. HPV right there on that one. Thank you, sir. I want to wash your hands. Okay. So, what are the two types? You have the DNA and the RNA. And HPV is a good example of a DNA virus. It has DNA inside itself and injects it into your cell, goes across the cytoplasm, and then it has to go into the nucleus. I think we talked about this with genetics last week. What's better, if you have to get infected with a virus, which one would be better to be infected with, a DNA or RNA? DNA, why? Because the cytoplasm usually doesn't have DNA, so it gets destroyed. So it has a greater chance of getting destroyed. RNA, the RNA creeps across the cytoplasm. When it gets up to the nucleus, then it transforms into DNA and quickly injects into the nucleus. And HIV, and of course we know which one's more deadly, HPV or HIV. HIV. So HIV, RNA, we call them retroviruses, by the way. Retro means backwards. Instead of starting a DNA and turning the RNA to get backwards, it goes RNA to DNA. And then here's just a little list of some of the ones you want to be familiar with. So hepatitis, we'll talk about when we get to what organ? The liver. Okay. So hepatitis B, C, they're viruses. So when they spread, they go in, they affect your DNA, and do you get rid of them? Nope. You get them for life. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, do you remember what I told you earlier this is associated with? Mono. Yep. So mono, it gets into your T cells, or yeah, your T cells, it gets into your T cells and starts changing the T cells. The problem with it is once it's in there, it doesn't go away. It goes dormant, and usually people can handle it for years and years and years of being dormant. 
But one of the things we're finding now is Epstein Barr can come back nasty like. And it, they think that it can actually lead to multiple sclerosis because there are characteristics of the Epstein Barr virus that actually mimics um, the, the myelin sheath. Uh, next one, Kaposi sarcoma. And this one, this is actually this here. So these are blood vessels. They're little blood vessels that affects the wall of the blood vessels and they start rupturing. And you start getting these little tiny welts all over the place. And Kaposi sarcoma, what you want to remember with that one is it's usually common with HIV. So the Kaposi sarcoma virus likes to travel with HIV. So do you remember what it affects? Sarcoma. Connected tissue. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The next one, HPV, we already talked about. And I just showed you the transition for HPV. Here you have non-affected tissue. And it starts becoming affected. And then all of these are the viral carrying. And then where do you usually hear about HPV occurring at? The genitalia. Genitalia. I'm just reading right into that. I was checking out the time. All right, and then the last one there, human T-cell leukemia or lymphovirus. So with this one, it's typically an adult-related leukemia or lympho lymphoma. Is there a benign version of it? Nope. Typically, it affects adult. But it can actually be transmitted through breast milk, too. H human T cell uh, HTLV is a short version of it. Okay. And then a bacteria. How can a bacteria cause cancers? It's because they do cell damage. When we talked about cells very first week. So here's the lining of your stomach. Here you have that mucus layer that's very basic. Right? And then you have the wall. This little guy can squirming around. It starts releasing its little enzymes around the outside. These enzymes are like ammonia. So what property do they have? They're basic. What property about the stomach usually prevents you from getting bacteria going through the stomach? Very acidic. So what they've done is they've created this coating that neutralizes their environment. So it's like them having a scuba diving suit. They come swimming through, they get down to the wall of the stomach, and then they start attacking the wall. When they start attacking the wall, they irritate the wall. You can have one of two things happen. You can either break that membrane where this can't release the alkaline mucus, and then it starts allowing you to keep it on wall, which is going to cause a blood. It's a small Or, the other thing it does, does is release chemicals down into the cell to eat the cell, which increases reactive oxygen species and inflammation. And this inflammation causes a chain reaction that can cause problems in the DNA. So inflammation, improper enzymes, irritation of the tissue, all those things can cause changes in the DNA. If you change the DNA, you have a mutation that leads to cancer. So it usually starts as stomach ulcers as being a physical symptom, and then you know, chronic stomach ulcers can lead to stomach cancer. And this is a zoom in of one of those cells. So you can see the H. pylori releasing its enzymes to cause a chain reaction with the inflammation that causes a change in the DNA. And down here, inflammation factors that come back around and change the DNA. So you've got basically this whole pathway changing the DNA. The first week, we talked about free radicals. Free radicals, they attack the cell membranes, they attack the enzymes inside, they attack the nucleus, they attack the DNA. They don't care. They just start attacking things. They're kind of like hydrogen ion. You've got this little hydrogen with a missing teddy bear. That's what a free radical is, is that it had a teddy bear that somebody stole it. Now it's kicked off and it's trying to destroy everything all over the place. It will go into the DNA and attack the nucleic acids and make the DNA change. Can your, job, can your job cause cancer? And this, you heard about tons in the 80s because we first started discovering that this stuff, you may know what this stuff is. It's an insulation that they used to use in buildings and they can't hang on. Asbestos. Yeah. So this is asbestos. These little tiny flakes of asbestos, you can inhale them. If they get in, you can't break them apart. They get down in your alveoli, 
and then your alveoli tries to rub the little cells inside the alveoli that kind of clean them up. They need it. Macrophages. They come along and the macrophage tries to eat this and the spear it. And then this slivers towards the way deeper and deeper and deeper and causes problems with the wall of the lung. So when you have little factors like this that don't break down, you can't process this. You can't break it down. When it gets in there, it just causes one problem after another. An inflammation response, which we saw before, causes it to be free radicals. That just makes the situation worse and worse. And you can have you can have exposure to asbestos 20 years ago and not have any symptoms, and it just poof, it hits you this year. So it takes a while to kick in. Um, these other things like dyes, rubber, paint, um, paint cement, these things are usually alcohol-based or alcohol-based solvents. What would be the problem with those? Alcohol-based. They're lipid-soluble, right? So do you have to drink them or inhale them? All you have to do is expose them to your skin and they can actually be inside of your body. So if they're some kind of a solvent and they have a heavy metal in it, like they have a lead chemical or a mercury chemical in them, you put it on your skin, it seeps right into your skin. And then with asbestos, mesothelioma, it affects the mesothelial layer around the lungs. So mesothelial layer and the oma is a tumor. Um, ooh, one that's not on here, or I just don't see it. Radon. So radon gas. Do you just have to worry about that in your occupation? No. You will worry about it in your basement, right? So if you have a house in a house with a basement and it's built over uranium, as the uranium decays, it releases radon gas in your basement. It starts filling up your basement with an invisible, um, undetectable gas. You can't smell it. And then it gets into your lungs and starts causing mutations. And when I was doing rotations, there was a woman that had one of her lungs removed because she had, had um, cancer in the lung. She didn't have breast cancer or any other problem, but it was just in the lung. She never smoked. Her family weren't smokers, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And then she had her house tested. She had super high level of radon in her, her basement. And she was she did basically these crusades across Iowa for awareness. And there are more people killed by radon in the state of Iowa than there are car accidents or car fatalities in Iowa. So it's something to kind of be concerned about. And this is what it looks like. So in this situation, there's your as your piece of asbestos. You can see the body's trying to grab a hold of it and break it down, but it just can't break it down. And then, so what it'll usually do is it'll try and isolate it off and get these clumps. What do you call that cheese-like necrosis? You have Cassius necrosis, or Cassius necrosis, and it just wears down, wears down, wears down, and then eventually the cancers will take the person. But yeah, it could. You could be out of the environment for 20 years and then suddenly you have mesothelioma because of asbestos. So once it gets in you, it stays in you. Right? What kinds of radiation affects us? And then you want to think of two primary ones. You have UV radiation and X ray radiation. And what they do is they get into the cells and they typically cause free radicals. It's known as radiation. The nice thing is we're using di these different types of radiation nowadays to target cancer cells. And it does the same thing to cancer. You go in, you zap it. It changes the DNA of the cancer and it makes it die. It can't live anymore. But what happens when you have exposure to radiation is it breaks the DNA and it doesn't repair properly. Oops, there's my radon. You can see the spread of radon and uh, deaths per year nationally, not just Iowa, but nationally. Drunk driving and then radon gas, drowning, fires, and airline crashes. So I put this in because I just thought it was kind of an interesting article. You see, uranium. Is that what Doc Brown put in the flux capacitor? No, that was plutonium. Oh, yeah. I just had a flashback to the this game. And then this is a fun one. So radiation, your cell phone. And we know that the cell phone puts off radiation. We know that it changes that activity in the brain, but we don't know for sure that it causes the cancers yet. So it's kind of an iffy thing so far. And I thought this was kind of interesting because we know that it changes the blood vessel response. So if you're stuck on your phone for a long, long time, and when we put you in an MRI afterwards, we see changed activity in that side of the brain just because of this close proximity of the uh, cell phones. So something to think about, get Bluetooth.
Hmm, that's actually, I wonder how many people that have the little Bluetooth thing on their ear have a chance for radiation for that. I was thinking Bluetooth on the car. And then obesity, linked to cancer. And you think, uh, obesity is one thing, cancer is totally different, but obesity can actually link to it. Obesity is linked to it because of the response it has with inflammation. When you have high levels of fat in your body, you actually have a greater inflammatory response in your body, which increases two things primarily. One is cancer risk. It sends these signals through your body that there's problems, 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 and it causes cancer change to the DNA. The other big change is diabetes. They're really looking at, they weren't really sure what exactly the link between fat and diabetes was. So they thought, well, maybe it was the diet factor, but now they're looking and they're saying that it was, it's actually inflammation. Having more adipose tissue in your, in your body increases inflammatory response, which causes problems in the pancreas and the release of insulin. So the key here is the obesity link to cancer is the inflammatory response. Causes increase of inflammatory response, which changes DNA. Okay, and then environmental risk factors. So... Physical activity, bad stuff. Don't do it. I'm kidding. This is the exact opposite. Where physical activity reduces cancer risk because it does cause some inflammation, but it burns the fat cells. It increases the flow of circulation through your body, so it helps you clear away inflammatory responses faster. So it decreases insulin-like growth factors, which can cause problems. So they're growth factors. They can increase the activity of cancers. Decrease the obesity, decrease the inflammatory mediators, the free radicals. It flushes them out, increases the activity of the antioxidants. And then this one, increases gut motility. Careful what you eat. We have a really high processed diet. A lot of our food basically turns to clay inside of our digestive tract. That's why they tell you to eat more what? Fiber. Yeah, you take in more fiber. I always think of fiber as being like sandpaper for your gut in a good way. It, it scrapes off the debris that is gunky clay off the walls of your intestines. When you eat a bunch of processed food, you've got all kinds of nasty stuff that can be carcinogenic. If it sticks along the wall of your GI tract, it can stick there and have more chance of causing cancers. So when you eat a lot of fiber, it brushes along your walls and scrapes that clay carcinogenic crap off. Pardon my intended. <laughs> but um, with the gut motility, it's the same thing. When you're walking, you're squeezing. If you're Busy walking and you're running, what happens to your sympathetic nervous system? It goes up. What should happen to your gut motility? It should go down. It's not because of the sympathetic nervous system, though. It's because when you squeeze your abdominal muscles, you're helping process food. Um, every time that you move your core, you're smashing your GI tract and you're moving food through the rapidly. The processing more rapidly. So that's the thing you better get motility. I brought that up because I had somebody ask, well, if you're exercising, does it increase sympathetic and turn down motility? She was right, but at the same time, because you're moving those muscles, you're actually increasing the movement. Okay. And the goal is 30 minutes a day and having a body mass index of under 25, which isn't the best um, estimate of fitness, but it's a nice general one. So 30 minutes a day of exercise, and they found that that reduces, I don't remember the percentage, it reduces the risk of cancer as well. All right. It's uh, 3 o'clock. We'll take another five-minute break. I'll see you at 3 o Well, it's 3.03, so I'll see you at 3.08.